Welcome to Catch Outdoors. I'm your host, Captain Rob Modis. Contact emails, catchoutdoors at gmail.com. Website, catchoutdoors.com. My Facebook page is Catch Outdoors. Catch Outdoors is presented by the Waypoint Podcast Network at waypointtv.com. Got a couple of books. They're available on Amazon Kindle. One's called Bridge to Paradise. Bunch of short stories. I'll get this out. Don't worry. (laughs) The other one's What I Know About Fishing Southwest Florida. If you live on that coast or you're planning to visit the Sanibel, Fort Myers area, by all means, check it out. Book three is in the works. It's got a working title now. Take a kid fishing, a parent's guide for introducing youngsters to the world of angling. Look for it. Mm, later this summer. Episode 42, titled South Florida Adventure Pass. South Florida Adventure Pass. Uh, My daughter and granddaughter were just here in South Florida for a summer visit. Ten days worth. And as usual, there was lots and lots of beach time and lots and lots of food and drink and just fun stuff. I'll touch about I'll touch on the food part at the uh, at the end of this. But this podcast is going to revolve around something called the South Florida Adventure Pass, uh, and it's fun and the value is well worth it. And uh, my wife and I got this, and it, it's just it's it was fantastic. So basically, what this is. It's a summer-long pass. Um, You get four attractions for the price of one in our area. And they really mean that because I have been to all of them and know the prices. So this is really quite quite a deal. And the reason I want to talk about it is it's a great place. All four of these places are good for family, friends, yourself, you know, at a sheer boredom. Summertime, man, it gets hot. Some of these, a couple of these few things are inside or you can get inside. Um, and it, it's, it's, they're really great. So what I'm going to go over, I'm going to do them in, in order of the, of the way I experienced them. I'll start with Sawgrass Recreation Park. That's one of them. That's out in the Everglades. Uh, and then we'll talk about Flamingo Gardens, the Museum of Discovery and Science here in Fort Lauderdale. And then we'll talk about Butterfly World. And I'll give you a little rundown on each one of them so that you have a, a fairly good idea of what they're all about. Um, all four of these locations are located in Broward County, uh, within easy uh, easy drive of Fort Lauderdale itself. And I'll, I'll be more specific when I get get to who and what we're talking about here. But um, they the the inclusion of these four areas pretty much it's very broad. So, for example, the Museum of Discovery and Science is kid oriented and adult oriented, both really. I think if you have children, they'll thoroughly enjoy it. It's a lot of touchy-feely going on in that place. Lots of experiments and things to look at. Obviously, out at Sawgrass, you get to ride in an airboat if you want to, and the airboat is is definitely cool as it could be. Um, And that is included in the admission price, so you don't pay extra for that. Uh, Butterfly World, uh, which is beautiful. Uh, It's exactly as advertised. It's just tons of butterflies. Um, and then the Flamingo Gardens, which we've been to several times now. I really like the Flamingo Gardens. So let's start with um, Sawgrass Recreation Park. We'll, we'll do that one first. I do love the Everglades, so I can't say enough nice things about it. Um, you enjoy a 30 to 40 minute airboat ride. That's part of the adventure. Uh, they have exhibit areas uh, with adopted and rescued uh, critters, reptiles, most alligators, things like that. Um, they've also got a th- place called the Gator Grill. They got a Sweet Tooth Cafe. They got a gift shop. Uh, but the big deal is getting out in the glades on an airboat, which is which is pretty cool. Um, this is a group trip. It's not re- in, in our case in the summertime. It's not going to be overly crowded. I don't know what the capacity of the boat is. I'd have to guess twenty. You know, like uh, say five per seat in four, maybe maybe a little more than that. But in our case, we had maybe three people in each row. And it was great. Uh, the guide was excellent. Uh, I believe his name was Case. Yeah, guide, Captain Case. And he was really good. He was able to tell tell us information about the glaze and some things that I did not know, which I thought was really interesting. Um, we we started out with that. We, we showed up and just decided to do the boat ride right off the bat. You can, you can mill about the place without doing that right away and just, you know, sign in and get yourself ready to go. The gift shop is dangerous. 
<laughs> They've got a lot of cool items in that. I got to tell you what, it's probably one of the best attraction gift shops I've been in since doing like Disney or Universal. Uh, it was it was pretty amazing and and very neat things that have to do with Florida and the Everglades and obviously gators and critters and snakes and all that kind of fun stuff. But anyway, we enjoyed the gift shop. Um, the ride itself is... is uh, uh, spectacular. It really is. It's just a great ride. I mean, it's slow. They go slow. Uh, we were warned ahead of time. I want to tell you this right up front so you all know what's going on. And, and our driver was good. He, he was. Um, the water was very high, is very high here. We had a ton of rain a month ago. And it takes a long time for that sheet flow to come all the way down through Florida, go into the Everglades, and then slowly drain off uh, south toward um, uh Florida Bay and of course east and west toward the Gulf and the Atlantic. So that, it takes a while for that water to go down, and unfortunately, that does not bode well for looking for alligators. Um, long story short, the Everglades is thousands and thousands and thousands of acres of water, and when the water is up, the alligators can go anywhere. They can, <laughs> they can, they can hide. And I mean, well, not hide. They could just cruise, and so the odds of seeing one are slim. And they were. We did not see an alligator during the trip. The good news is we saw an alligator at the dock. <laughs> so that's the way it goes sometimes. It's okay. So keep that in mind. It might not be a bad idea to check water levels and just ask, you know, what's going on? If, you, if you've got your heart set on an alligator, that's probably the best thing to do. We saw all kinds of other wildlife. There were lots of different fish in the water, birds in the trees, and our captain was was really good, well versed on all of them. Um, and I'm speaking from experience because I had to learn all that stuff too, being a charter captain. So, you get asked a lot of questions about stuff, and sometimes it's very very difficult to answer some of them. But he he did a very very good job on on covering um, the creatures and critters that we saw. At one point, uh, a couple points, he puts the boat up to full speed, and that's that's pretty wild. I, I can't imagine. I'm not sure what our speed was. But it is pretty impressive. This this is a fairly large airboat um, carrying, like I said, say 15 people at this time. And we were scooting. It's got twin engines on the back. If you're not familiar with an airboat, this is this is a system that does not have a, a keel, if you will. Uh, it, it, it doesn't steer as a normal boat does. This one had twin aircraft engines in the back. Uh, there are little rudders on the aircraft engine, but that offers very little um, steering. Basically, what he does is he he speeds up one engine or the other to turn. Um, it'll go over anything. It'll go over you know four, five, six inches of water, uh, mostly grass in some cases. It'll go over uh, in, back in the Everglades areas. Uh, a lot of the places are protected. They can't run airboats in the areas. In this case, at Sawgrass, they have a huge recreation park where they're allowed to do that. And you do get a good feeling of, of going out into an area that is obviously seldom visited by anybody, including including me. <laughs> I've been in the glades a lot, but it was it was exhilarating to go into a, an area that uh, that was kind of in the middle of nowhere. What's really nice about being out there was this feeling of, of nature. Um, uh, take your camera, make sure you snap lots of pictures. Um, he will stop to do a talk. The, all the captains will stop and do a talk. So you have time to take photographs of where you stand up and take photographs. Um, and uh, yeah, again, I really, really enjoyed it. I had a great time uh, out there. Back at the dock. They had taken pictures of us before we boarded. You know, if those of you have been on a cruise, you know, or go, or when you go to Disney, you know, they snap a shot of you when you come off a ride, that kind of thing. Well, they did that. They had these they had these pictures of us as we were on, getting on board. And to be honest with you, they were great. And yes, we bought one. We bought three. <laughs> so, yeah, so you can get a picture without you having to worry about taking a selfie. So that that's kind of nice. Um, one other thing... Um, don't worry about taking a hat with you. If you do, you're going to have to fold it up and put it away because it'll just blow off. And they also provide earplugs for you. So you can use earplugs. And trust me, you will need them when that thing is running at high speed. So anyway, it's a great time. Really great time. And uh, thank you very much, Captain Case, uh, for giving us such a good trip. Next on the list, uh, we picked up and visited Flamingo Gardens. Now, I've done this before. I'll give you some direction on where it is. Uh, Flamingo Gardens is located in Davie, Florida, which is part of Broward County. It's on the far uh, western side of the, well, not the far western, but well, about as far out as you can go, really getting pretty close to it. Uh, oddly enough, it's off Flamingo Road. <laughs> go figure. 
Um, back when I lived here 25 years ago, uh, before moving back here, um, that area out there was primarily huge um, agricul- uh, uh, agricultural area. It also had a lot of palm plants and things like that and orchid uh, places. Um, it's since grown a little, but not much. I mean, you don't really get the feeling that that it's over. I don't know, overpopulated, even though it's been 25 years where a lot of other places in Florida are. Flamingo Gardens is kind of unique. Um, uh, years ago, it was it was a private home is how it started. It's 60 acres. Uh, it's a botanical garden, a wildlife sanctuary, and home to over 3,000 tropical plants. Um, it actually... It's, it has one of the largest collections of native wildlife in Florida, which is pretty interesting. Um, the Ray Home, which is the people that live there, it is still on the premises along with a lot of other um, small buildings that were part of the residence. And my favorite thing when I go there is to look at the residence and just trying to imagine living in the jungle because that's really what it looks like. It, um, it's, it's fantastic. Um, there are wetlands there. You can see gators, and you will see gators, bobcats, panthers, peacocks, uh, flamingos. There's a bear there. There's a, a Florida black bear. So there's lots of things to see and do. It's a good mix for adult and kids. Um, if you're an adult on your own, by all means, I recommend it because it's certainly worth seeing the gardens and walking through the, the beautiful different areas that they have. Um, and if you've got kids, they loved it. One of the, the things that I noticed the kids and my daughter, my granddaughter and daughter liked, liked the most were the peacocks. There are literally dozens of peacocks. Three basic varieties, one that you're used to seeing, kind of the standard brightly colored purples and greens. And then there was a kind of a rusty colored one and then white ones, pure white. I'd never seen those before. Uh, so that was that was pretty interesting, and the peacocks are quite friendly, and they love to show off. So they're always you know spreading their the uh, the tail, and you know it's crazy, but it was enjoyable. Uh, gift shop, yep, oh yeah, oh yeah, they'll capture you in the gift shop. It's another good one, and there's uh, there's food and drink and things like that that you can get there. Uh, all we did when we took when we went there, we just took a bottle of water, just stuck it. I stuck it in you know in my back cargo pants pocket, and we we carry water around with us. But that was really all that was necessary. It was a hot day, but quite frankly, the entire Flamingo Gardens is is primarily in shade. Um, so I, my I guess my favorite thing were the areas where they had hawks and owls. And then I, I really, really, obviously, I mean, I'm a, a big orchid freak, so I like the orchid areas that they had and the things that were growing. Uh, they had an amazing amount of orchids growing in the area, and I, I love that, uh, especially the vandas, uh, which I'm good at killing. I, I think I mentioned that in a previous podcast when I, I like, I love orchids. I have orchids, quite a few of them, and but I'm really good at killing vandas. Vandas are an unusual orchid in that they aren't planted in any type of uh, bark or dirt or, or, or substance. They actually have free roots, which require moisture. They're, well, they require humidity. And I'm just not good at that, apparently. I don't know. They just don't like me. <laughs> anyway, they had lots of them and they were absolutely beautiful. Uh, so be sure to check it out. If, you, if you're in that area or you're in the Fort Myer, uh, Fort, listen to me, that's where I used to live. If you're in the Fort Lauderdale area, uh, Broward County, and you head out toward Flamingo Road, uh, check out Flamingo Gardens. It's a, it's a really good uh, family thing to visit. Yes, I, I still mix up the Fort Lauderdale, Fort Myers. I lived in Fort Myers for, I don't know, 20, 21, 22 years. Lived over here before that. We moved back. We moved back three years ago uh, to Fort Lauderdale. They're both fort, for crying out loud. I have a real hard, you know, your brain just goes fort and you spit out whichever one. So I'm getting better. I'm getting better now Now that I've been over here long enough to uh, to get control of that, of that name. So anyhow, uh, next on the list is going to be the Museum of Discovery and Science. Okay, I'm gonna read. I'm gonna read this, the Museum of Discovery and Science thing, right off the brochure because I got such a kick out of this. Um, it's the Museum of Discovery and Science. First of all, the locals call it MODS, M O D S. So that's you'll you'll hear that referred to even locally. Uh, you know, in in some of the written things, I guess the Museum of Discovery and Science is, is just too much of a mouthful. Um, I would like to note before I get into the displays they had, uh, there is an IMAX there too as well. And as a matter of fact, right now they're showing the um, the new um, Top Gun movie Maverick, 
and which I have not seen yet. And I may have to visit the IMAX. I would have to imagine watching that on an IMAX theater would really be something. So Mods is more than 150,000 square feet of mind-blowing, boredom-busting, interactive exhibits. <laughs> I love that. Um, they also have the only aviation-themed uh, maker's space. And what that means is, that, okay, so let me back up. Adults, you'll enjoy this. Kids will enjoy it even more. So if it's family and you're bringing the, uh, I mean, I saw children as young as three or four just loving this place. And we had school children there on field trips when we were there the other day doing their afternoon, you know, their field breaks. And gosh, and Moses, it, I, I just, the kids were really excited. Um, if you want to avoid crowds and crowds and crowds of kids and you're an adult, you might want to plan on going when school's in session. So it might be a little, a little less hectic out there at the museum, but all in all, they handled it well. And the place is huge. So there's enough room for everybody. Um, the aviation theme, um, uh, Makerspace is quite simply, it's really, it just basically teaches kids all about aer aer aeronautics and aerodynamics. It's, it's interesting. There's everything from airplanes that they can fly, literally sit in and pretend like they're flying with video screens and that kind of stuff. Um, there are all kinds of parts and pieces to, to very large aircraft there. Um, cockpits that they can climb into. I think one of the most intriguing things that I enjoyed was the making paper airplanes. <laughs> yes, they did that. They had this huge area with um, uh, a, oh, it was like a, uh, had rings hanging from the ceiling, if you will. And it was enclosed on left and right sides. And you, you could build an airplane, design your own out of paper, paper airplane, which I'm quite good at because that was something we did quite a lot of when I was a kid. And then you fly it and you try to fly it through the rings. So it's a contest. The kids were all over it. And they were building airplanes like crazy. Um, yes, it's recycled paper, <laughs> I asked. I was also marveling at where some of the airplanes wound up. Uh, some of the kids were very, very good at building an aerodynamic one that would that would climb and wind up in the rafters and in other areas of the museum. I thought, wow, this is this is truly amazing. Um, they also have a wildlife habitat. They have a, a really beautiful area of, of outdoor um, Florida like habitat, like swamp, uh, lakes, uh, creeks. You know, there's otters. There's all kinds of things in those displays. Uh, they have an early, what I'll call an early Florida display, showing you the days of the saber-toothed tiger, the mastodon, and and the way that that this area was was literally a, a totally different prehistoric area than it is now uh, before ice ages. And so that was kind of interesting. Now, they have documentary films at the IMAX theater, so you can go in and watch documents uh, about all kinds of things. They've got a long, long list of stuff. Um, wild animal encounters and de demonstrations. Um, I like the, um, the health science area. They had a huge area where kids can learn basically how your human body works, uh, heart rates and blood pressure and all that kind of stuff. And then they have special groups come in and, and set up very, very special displays uh, for um, science or its uh, displays. And what's in there right now is this huge uh, mechanical dinosaur. Um, it's hard. I'll do my best to explain it. Imagine the bones of a dinosaur made out of metal and they're hooked to pulleys. And these dinosaur bones and pulleys and heads and all that can be moved by you kids, whoever's standing in front of the controls. Some of them use controllers like on a game machine, like a, a PS4, PS5 now, uh, Xboxes, things like that. Um, others are manual, where you pull levers and things to make these giant creatures move their heads or their feet or whatever. It was remarkable. I mean, it really. I was I was really really um, in, intrigued by the whole thing. All done by one designer, one gentleman who had built all of them. I I venture to say there were fourteen or fifteen of them on display, from very large to uh, man size, if you will. The kids, of course, all you have to do is mention dinosaurs around a child, and they're they're pretty much totally sucked in. So I found that I found that really really cool. There's a huge outside playground area. Um, I don't know if I want to call it. It's more of a science playground. I guess it'd be the best way to put it. I had that. And then there was also a section uh, upstairs on the second floor of gemstones, uh, typically found gemstones. 
uh, most of them from around Florida. So it was not not the stones themselves, but it was all kinds of um, uh, you know crystals and things like that. And they were very well displayed and very well labeled. And I enjoyed looking at those because you got you got to take for granted that we know those things that are here below us in Florida. But until you see them all laid out with all the different labels on them, you really have no idea how many there really are in the in the soil around us. All right, let's move out to butterflies. Butterfly world. It's huge. I mean, gigantic. <laughs> it really is. Um, it's located in Trade Winds Park, which is in Coconut Creek, Florida, which is also Broward County. Uh, it's in That would be in the upper, like the northwest corner of Broward County. Um, Trade Winds is an enormous park. Um, I mean, I mean, really, I mean, just a gorgeous park. It's got lots of lakes, lots of uh, areas to to basically hide under the trees, get out of the heat, even though you're outdoors. Uh, there is an enormous stables located there, horse stables uh, for horse riding there. I believe the horse riding takes place on the weekends. I don't think they do it during the weekdays, uh, but they also stable horses there. There is a grow area where they are experiment with all kinds of growing, all kinds of Florida native plants. Um, but butterfly world itself is is kind of the real the real feature. And butterfly world is unique in the fact that they actually raise butterflies there uh, from beginning to end, from from caterpillar to chrysalis to to uh, you know I guess you call it hatching <laughs> into a butterfly. Um, they actually market out uh, chrysalises of different kinds to different areas, uh, but the display area for the butterflies is really is really something to see. Uh, I love. I, not only do I love butterflies, but I love the native plants that are required to attract butterflies. And I'm a real advocate of native of native plants in in the state of Florida. We we have long been watering too much, and that happens with a lot of our out of state guests. And I'm not picking on you. We love having you here, and we like having you move here. That's okay too. Uh, but we do things a little differently here. We have uh, dry season and wet season, and and it's difficult to find a plant that's happy in that. Um, when I say dry, I mean really dry. I mean, we not may not have any rain at all for most of December, January, February, and March. And then all of a sudden, April comes, and we get, yes, April showers, I guess you could say. Not very many. Then May, June, July, August comes, September, and all of a sudden, it's that's tropical. That's hurricane season, and it rains almost every single day. Finding a plant that can tolerate that is really, really tough. Well, it just so happens we have tons and tons of native plants. And native plants work in a way that uh, behooves you to have butterflies. You, you, you'll, just, you'll naturally get them if you just plant native plants. And the native plants are hardy enough to where they're not affected all that much by that huge swing in moisture. So all of a sudden, you don't have to worry about ordering plants in the wintertime to try to keep them alive. They will pretty much take care of themselves. They may fall back a little. They may even turn a little brown on the edges and not look quite right to you, but that's okay. They'll make a comeback as soon as the waters, uh, as soon as the rain starts to come. What's unique about the Florida plants is the ability of these plants to draw butterflies in. They're, they are two class, they're classified two classes, host and nectar plants. The host plant will host butterflies, the caterpillars. Um, that's where the butterfly comes to lay the eggs uh, on the host plant. So what that means is when the caterpillar hatches, the caterpillar starts eating the host. <laughs> now, there are some people that really panic when they see that. It's like, oh my God, there's worms on my plant. He's eating all my plant. No, that's supposed to happen. Those are caterpillars and they're nourishing themselves so that they can go to the chrysalis stage. And that's where they go into the, you know, like a cocoon. Or, you know, that's not really what it's called, but that's what it looks like. It may be hanging on a branch or fence post or something like that. And over a period of time, not very long, three, four weeks at the most. Well, I can't say that for every butterfly, but let's just say average of three to four weeks. They eventually hatch out and boop, out pops a new butterfly. That butterfly, when it pops out, it needs nourishment. So what's it do? It looks for the nectar plant. And it's not as specific on nectar as it is on host. Hosts can be very, very specific. Only like one or two plants will work for one or two species of butterfly. So these things are real important in the state of Florida. And I stress it. If you're moving here, if you're already here and you're having difficulty with landscaping, talk to somebody about natural native plants. Uh, they're beautiful. They flower. Most of them flower year round. Um, and at the same time, they offer the host uh, nourishment for for both 
stages of the butterfly for well, technically all three stages of the butterfly. So keep that in mind. Butterfly Gardens has got the biggest display I've ever seen. They also have a, uh, a garden center where they sell the plants. So if you're in the area, if you're in Broward County or, in your, or you're in East Florida, or even if you're over on the West Coast and you want to travel over and check it out, um, they have a fantastic selection of of butterfly plants. So it's it's something, I mean, definitely worth traveling for, I think, because uh, I enjoy them very much. And they, they make a huge difference in, uh, in the amount of water that we do. And that's getting to be more and more important in the state of Florida. All right, let's do some specifics here. The Adventure Pass is available at SouthFloridaAdventurePass.com. That's SouthFloridaAdventurePass.com. There's more information on each one of these places at, let's see, Sawgrass Recreation Park is in Western Florida. It's EvergladesTours.com, EvergladesTours.com. Flamingo Gardens is FlamingoGardens.org. The Museum of Discovery and Science in Fort Lauderdale is Mods.org. That's M-O-D-S dot org. And Butterfly Garden is, I'm sorry, Butterfly World is Butterfly World. How about that? Dot com. That's ButterflyWorld.com. The only additional charge that you might run into at any one of those four locations is only at Butterfly World. It is located within a state park, uh, not a state park, a, uh, a county park. And they do charge on weekends and holidays to use the park. So on weekdays, you just cruise right through the gate, but you pay. So there might be a gate fee in effect. Sometimes they don't, sometimes they do, but just be aware of that at Butterfly World that that can happen. Food and drink. <laughs> People, I love food and I love a good drink. Not to excess, don't drive and drink, you know. Yeah, I, I have to say that right up front. Um, but I enjoy both and I really enjoy uh, going to uh, restaurant, new restaurants. I like experimenting into, you know, ooh, that place looks cool. So uh, with my daughter and granddaughter in tow, we uh, and Janelle, she was with my wife at times. <laughs> she works a lot. Um, <laughs> we were, we just, you know, we visited a bunch of places. And at, at the top of the list, number one was a place called Tiki Tiki, which was uh, the fault of my wife. She said, we, We've got to go to this place. We got to check it out. And so Tiki Tiki is located in um, um, Dania Beach. <laughs> Man, there's a lot of places in this podcast. Dania Beach is uh, located just south of the International Airport, Fort Lauderdale International, and it has a there's a Dania Beach fishing pier. And there's a bridge that runs out to Dania Beach, and if you go across the bridge and hang an immediate right, so in other words, you're heading south. On the right hand side is Tiki Tiki. It's it's almost under the bridge, and uh, on the intercoastal waterway it has water views. Let me tell you what, the food was fantastic. I was really impressed. It's very, it's kind of just rustic outdoors. Um, I, it's, no, it's not fancy. I mean, you put your shorts and your t-shirt on, you'll be comfortable. You can dress up if you want to. There were people that are dressed up, but you don't have to. Um, but the location is really, I really enjoyed the location. Uh, food was great. Uh, let's see, I had a mahi, mahi dish. Uh, also known as dolphin fish, which sometimes freaks out people from it. They'll see dolphin on the menu. What? You don't eat dolphin. No, dolphin fish. That's different. Mahi, mahi. So um, it was really good. Do absolutely delicious. Drinks were great. Uh, service was fantastic. Uh, we really had a good time there. So I can, I can recommend that one. Uh, the old standby Aruba's. We go to Aruba's quite a bit. That's a restaurant located at um, Lauderdale by the Sea. Also next to a fishing pier. Do you find that odd that I like restaurants next to? Yeah, well, those of you that know me and know how much I love fishing, this will all make sense. But Aruba's, again, great menu, lots of goodies on it. Um, if you sit up at the bar, um, I think it's from 2 to 5. Don't hold me to that. They have like an afternoon hour session in there where you actually can get your food for half price just because you're sitting at the bar. Um, they have live music. It's a lot of fun. Great place. And a beautiful view of the Atlantic Ocean from inside. So in other words, you can get tables by windows to view the Atlantic, which is kind of nice. And I don't know, just I, really good food, really excellent food. J Marks, J, initial J and then Marks, J Marks. That is a little local restaurant near us on US-1, um, located in the heart of Fort Lauderdale. Um, it's like an old style restaurant with booths. Outside dining, um, great food. 
And that has become our regular neighborhood stop for us. I love the burgers, but they also have a great deal of uh, really good fresh seafood and a really interesting mix of dishes at J. Mark's and an enormous menu. The menu is like page after page, you know, pastas and chickens. And I hope I'm making all of you hungry that are listening to this. Uh, one very special place that we like to go is down on uh, Fort Lauderdale Beach, and that's Takato. T-A-K-A-T-O, Takato. Takato is a fusion Korean a Japanese restaurant. It uh, and now my mouth is watering. <laughs> they serve a uh, sushi, tons of beautifully made sushi, and then you flip it over and you get the Korean, more or less like the cook dishes, the Korean style dishes. So you can pretty much mix and match. Um, they serve wagyu beef and things like that. This uh, I will warn you, Takato is not cheap. Okay, just I'm going to lay it right out there. This is either a once a month or a special occasion type restaurant, um, unless you like spinning the big bucks, which of course you can absolutely do. But uh, I, I I love being there. I mean, I really do. The view is also spectacular. It looks out right again at the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and it has a tiered porch, which puts you above the people. You're like on a second floor, so you're above the people that are walking by. So you have a, an unobstructed view uh, out to the Atlantic. Food is great. Drink is great there, too, by the way. Some really interesting um, cocktails. The Beach House. Last but not least, the Beach House, and certainly not the least. The Beach House is um, located in Pompano, at Pompano Beach. Um, and guess what it's next to? <laughs> That's right. The pier, the fishing pier. <laughs> that is really a special place. It's very, very interesting. First of all, reservations are required Monday through Friday, but they don't take them on the weekend. So you need to know that. So you really need to check this. The, the reservation system is tricky here. The reason for that is, is the upstairs, which is a tiered system from top to bottom, has tables out on balconies that look out over the ocean. They are highly sought after. You have a good chance of getting them on a weekday. Um, if you get there early enough with your reservation and you request it, you've got a good shot at getting it. Otherwise, they are considered first come, first serve. Weekends, impossible, unless you happen to be standing at the door when it opens You know, in the, in the afternoon or the evening. But it's certainly worth it. The upstairs bar is huge. Um, the entertainment's good. It's just, it's just it's a it's a happening place. That's that's all I can say. The beach house uh, has really great fresh seafood, um, custom made cocktails. Uh, it's you know, and and we love it because I mean I I really like a menu where you have lots of choices. I don't I don't I try not to order the same thing every time I go to a restaurant over and over again. I like to sample and play around on the menu. And as a matter of fact, all these places that I mentioned have that going for them. So if you're looking for something extremely casual, tiki tiki, if you want to work your way up, then Takato would probably be the top of the list. But all of those restaurants I mentioned are really great and they're all located right here in this area. So bon appetit. Thank you so much for listening. I appreciate you taking the time to tune in. If you enjoyed the podcast, please tell a friend and leave a review. My podcasts are scheduled on each and every Tuesday. Catch you Outdoors is presented by the Waypoint Podcast Network. It's available on Waypoint and by many of your favorite podcast providers. Facebook page is Catch you Outdoors. Website, waypointtv.com and catchoutdoors.com. Until next time, get outdoors and enjoy.